I invite you to turn with me in Acts chapter 23 as we resume our series in that book, picking up in verse 23 this morning. Acts chapter 23, verses 23 to 35. If you are able, I invite you to stand with me as a sign of reverence for Scripture. Acts chapter 23, verses 23 through 35. This is God's word. And he that is the commander there in Jerusalem called to him two of the centurions and said, Get 200 soldiers ready by the third hour of the night to proceed to Caesarea with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. They were also to provide mounts to put Paul on and give him safely to Felix the governor. He wrote a letter, having this form. Claudius Lysias to the most excellent governor Felix, greetings. When this man was arrested by the Jews and was about to be slain by them, I came up to them with the troops and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. I wanted to ascertain the charge for which they were accusing him. I brought him down to their council, or Sanhedrin. And I found him to be accused over questions about their law, but under no accusation deserving death or imprisonment. When I was informed that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, also instructing his accusers to bring charges against him before you. So the soldiers, in accordance with their orders, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. But the next day, leaving the horsemen to go on with them, they returned to the barracks. When these had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter of the governor, they also presented Paul to him. When he, that is Felix, had read it, he asked from what province he was, and when he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing after your accusers arrive also, giving orders for him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. This is the word of the Lord. Please, Please, be, seated. Please be seated. Would you join me in prayer, please? Father, we pray that the words of my mouth and meditations on all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Has God ever delivered you? As you think back on your life, and you think of any time when God has delivered you. I'm being purposefully vague because I trust that if you believe in Christ, you do believe that no matter what else has happened in your life, that God has delivered you in Christ. He's delivered you from the, sin, from the judgment that your sins deserve as do mine. He's delivered you from the penalty of sin on the day of judgment. He's delivered you from the, the eternal consequences of your sin in hell. And in Christ, once for all, in principle, he has delivered you from the power of sin. Romans chapter 6. Sin no longer has power over you. In principle. Yeah. Meaning, you are no longer a slave to sin. Now, can you also think of times in your life when God has delivered you from any other situation, affliction, condition, distress, physical, emotional, financial, situational. Has God ever done that for you? If your answer is yes, why did God do that?
I'm hoping to create a little cognitive dissonance in you. I'm hoping to lead you to some tension where you wrestle with the question, does God deliver for a purpose? And if so, what is that purpose? Amen. Don, Don, Don is absolutely right. It's for his glory. Now I will tell you that especially since last year, this thought has crossed my mind a number of times. The question, why is God saving from leukemia? Fungal infection. I trust that we all agree that there is some sense in which God's providential will for us is inscrutable, which means we don't know what the future holds. I don't know what God's providential will will be for you or for me. My dad used to be fond of saying, I could get hit by a Mack truck today. Somehow, the Mac Corporation had the, the market corner on <laughs> hypothetical, untimely deaths. I confess to you that I don't know specifically why God delivered me from leukemia and the fungal infection, or why God has delivered you in his providence, speaking outside of Christ now. Scripture tells us why God saves us in Christ. It's to glorify him. Well, why God has saved you from whatever circumstances he saved you from in your life, with health, whatever your situation was. I can't tell you that because I don't know the future. And I don't even know, certainly don't know what God's inscrutable will is. None of us do. That's why it's called inscrutable. But I hope to make a case from Scripture this morning that God always has a purpose for delivering his people. Some of the purposes are general and universal. Some of the purposes are specific. I can only tell you about the general reasons. Because I went to seminary to study the Bible I did not go to seminary to study God's inscrutable providential will for each person. So I can't tell you the specific reasons that, or specific purposes that God has each one of you here for. That is for you to think about. That's for you to wrestle with. I heard a sermon once where the speaker said, I think this was on a, some online sermon I heard. You know, I try to avail myself of a variety of preaching styles and pastors from different backgrounds. I heard one speaker say once, it's not my job to resolve your tension. <laughs> it's, it's my job to create it. <laughs> I don't know how the Lord will resolve the tension in your particular life. But I do know that if you believe in Christ, God has ultimately delivered you from every ultimate death, destruction, punishment, and evil. And everything in Psalm 91 that I chose this morning for our call worship is true of you and will be ultimately true for you. And when we get to heaven, that's the ultimate deliverance. We'll be free of bodies that don't work. We'll be free from brains that can't remember anything. We'll be free from relational problems. We'll be free from sin. We won't sin against others and others won't sin against us. 
We'll be free from fill in the blank. Financial worries, health worries, whatever it is, everything will be perfect. I don't know what it will be like, but it will be perfect. I know that. In the meantime, the pattern of Scripture is that God often, though he's not obligated to, delivers his people from lots and lots of other temporal situations. He often, but not always, heals his people from all kinds of stuff. And if you're sitting in this room, you've, I'm sure there's, that everyone here has gotten sick to one degree or another at some point in your life, and God's healed you, and you're here. God's done it for a purpose. So when I looked at this text this morning, it's pretty clear that Paul's being delivered from this plot by the Jews. Forty of them, you remember last week, took a vow, we're not going to eat or drink until Paul dies. <laughs> yeah, how's that going? <laughs> yeah, how's that going, Jim said? <laughs> and it's amazing that God uses someone who's not a believer, to provide deliverance for Paul. Claudius Lysias. And God just doesn't just deliver Paul a little bit, like by the skin of his teeth. He doesn't just squeak through. He gives him 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen, all professionally trained, full-time, vocational soldiers in, at the time, the dominant military force on the planet. I don't think those 40 men are going to have much luck against 470 professional soldiers. So God doesn't just squeak Paul by. Paul overwhelmingly, excuse me, God overwhelmingly delivers Paul. Well, that's pretty straightforward. So I thought, well, why did God do that? Because when you think about it, at some point, God stopped delivering Paul. If church tradition is to be believed, Paul was beheaded in Rome sometime, Jim or Brad, Correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think it's something like 67. Is that right? 68 AD. Am I wrong on that? You can look it up. But at some point, God stopped delivering Paul. And at some point, temporarily speaking, he's going to stop delivering all of us. Because last time I checked, we're all going to die. <laughs> right? I, I haven't met the person yet who lived who's... 5,000 years old. <laughs> now, all of this sounds very uh, nothing is surprising, right? I, mean, I don't think anybody would disagree. I have a, I have a reason for my, my madness here. There's a method to my madness. Because, now you know, and, and Terry and I tease about it a lot, I'm always teasing about Joel Osteen, right? And the prosperity preacher. Right. And I know that none of you guys listen to those idiots, right? But here, here's what I do know. I know that all of you, including me, in some way have some contact with the culture that gave rise to those idiots. And I know it's the water that we swim in. It's the water that you swim in. And you swim in the water of a culture that says, whether it's a Christian at, uh, manifest iteration of it or not, you live in a culture that says, every day in every way, you're getting better and better. The world is getting better and better. And if there is a God, he certainly wants you to get better and better every day. And he wants every aspect of your life to be great. 
because we live in this culture where people pay thousands of dollars to go to conferences and hear so-called self-help coaches mo motivate them. And we watch TV where everything is about you and how great you are and how you just need to fulfill your potential. And so why should we be surprised when Christian preachers mold the Christian gospel to fit that idea where really the purpose of the gospel is not objective redemption for the purpose of glorifying him through the preaching of the gospel but the purpose of God, the purpose of Christ, the purpose of the kingdom of God is to make you reach your full potential. So what I'm trying to get you to think about is that scripture presents to us a God who delivers his people, but it's always with a purpose, and that purpose is not so that you will attain your full potential. God's purpose in delivering with Paul was not so that Paul could be more enlightened in and of itself, or that God, or Paul could fulfill his potential, or that Paul would experience his best life now. We know that that ultimately didn't happen for Paul. We know that Paul, like all the other apostles, were martyrs. And even if you subscribe to the idea that John died of old age, church tradition tells us that he was still boiled in oil along the way and miraculously survived. We'll figure out if that's true or not. But the point is, all of the apostles suffered. And I've told you before, but as my dad used to say, not today, about that funny little YouTube video called Lutheran Satire, where Hans Feeney takes all of these Renaissance and medieval paintings, paintings, medieval and Renaissance paintings of martyrs, and superimposes Joel Osteen quotes on them. <laughs> All right. Point number one, God's deliverance or lack of deliverance is always related to his kingdom. It's always related to his kingdom. When God brought his people out of the nation of Egypt, he did it for the purpose of revealing himself, calling a people to himself, Developing that people into a nation, giving them his laws, making them the channel through which his promises to Abraham. Abraham, for those of you who have been coming to the Tuesday morning men's Bible study on the base, his promises to Abraham. And you're looking down at the floor, Brent, but I see you. <laughs> Luke, you listening? Abraham would be carried out. All right. That was his purpose in bringing them out of Egypt. It wasn't just so they would be free from the discomfort of being slaves, although they did experience that. Okay. Book of Judges. Why did God deliver his people in Judges? It was to, it was to create the nation, purify the nation, expand his kingdom, in taking the land, completing the work of conquering Canaan, ultimately to prepare for the Messiah. But he delivered them. But then there was a time when he would stop delivering them, right? They would go worship this God, that God. And so the author of Judges tells us he would give them over to the Midianites. <clears throat> Fill in the blank, the Philistines. Right. What about the captivity? Right? Well, God ultimately delivered his people from the captivity. But it was he delivered them from captivity in order to bring the nation back into the land, in order to set up for the Messiah's arrival, in order to confront the nation as a nation in their own land by the Messiah. He could have let them stay in captivity and brought the Messiah to them in captivity, but... In his wisdom, he chose not to do that. 
He delivered them from captivity, but it was for the purpose of moving the ball down the field with regard to redemption. What about the New Testament martyrs? Right? Well, he delivered, he, uh, he allowed the New Testament martyrs to be killed, but he did so for the purpose of furthering the gospel. So when God chooses to deliver his people, or in the case of martyrs, chooses not to deliver his people, it's always for the purpose of expanding his kingdom. It's not simply for the benefit of the deliverance itself. As wonderful as that is, does that make sense? Number two, God will deliver his people, or not, precisely in accord with his inscrutable will for his kingdom. Now, he's ultimately delivered us in Christ. But when it comes to temporal deliverances or not being delivered, it all, God always has a plan for his kingdom. And that will is inscrutable, meaning we can't always armchair quarterback God's providence. If God had not delivered you from X, Y, Z, if God had not delivered me from leukemia, God's inscrutable will for his kingdom would still go forward. Amen. Think about, I mentioned the Exodus earlier, but do you realize that even though God brought out, I think that if I'm not mistaken, the text says something like 600,000 armed men for combat, so you estimate the whole nation is perhaps a couple of million. Maybe. Even though he brought a whole nation out of Egypt, if you remember, by the time we get to remember that passage, Numbers 14, the only people who came out of Egypt who saw the land were ultimately Caleb and Joshua. Right? So in God's providence, he delivered the whole nation, but then by the time we get to Numbers 14, he says, the rest of you guys Caleb and Joshua are going to get to see the land. Not even Moses got to see the land. That's what you get for hitting the rock. Aaron didn't get to see the land. Miriam didn't get to see the land. Only Caleb and Joshua got to see the land. Now, question. Did God deliver the whole nation? Yes. Did God temporally deliver the entire nation into the land of Egypt? Uh, excuse me, into the land of Canaan. Nope. Right. Did his inscrutable will for the kingdom still go forward? Yep. Yes. What about the return from captivity? I mentioned captivity earlier. Well, did God bring them back from captivity? Yes, he did. How many were brought into captivity? Well, off the top of my head, I can't remember. We know that when Ezekiel went over, there were at least 10,000 captives that went over. And then we know in 586, when the temple was destroyed, whoever was left was taken over. And they were there for more or less 70 years from the time that uh, Daniel and his friends went over. But Ezra records for us the number of people who were brought back under Zerubbabel. You remember, it wasn't a whole lot. And when you do the math, it was, if you include the servants, which interesting are, are it tells the people who came that it lists their servants, then it lists the animals, strangely. The number of souls was 49,697. So did God bring back, did God offer to bring back the entire nation? Yes. How many took him up on the offer? 49,697. Okay. Acts chapter 8 is a great example of this. Stephen has just been stoned. We're told in verse 1 of chapter 8 that Paul was, Saul was giving hearty approval to Stephen's death. And then it says there arose a terrible persecution in Jerusalem. And Saul began ravaging the church, going from house to house. And then it says in verse 4 of Acts chapter 8 that those who were persecuted scattered, preaching the word as they went. And the next story is Philip in Samaria. Right? Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went to Samaria. <laughs> Was the persecution bad? Yes. 
Did God deliver his people from persecution in Jerusalem? No. But did he have a purpose for doing it? Yes. Did the gospel expand because God in his sovereignty, in his inscrutable will, ordained that the church in Jerusalem would be persecuted? Yes. All right. You ready for the hard one? I gave you the easy ones up front. Here's the hard one. Maybe if I hide behind the pulpit. <laughs> All right. The Word of God is not comical. Whenever I start doing silly things like that, you know that I'm trying to compensate for something difficult that I feel that I should say but don't want to. Number three, we are not guaranteed God's deliverance in our lives from temporal things. The only guarantee we have is that God's kingdom will become more visible with or without our involvement. The only thing we're guaranteed is that the kingdom will be made more visible with or without our involvement. Matthew 16, verse 18, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not stand against it. Yeah. Hades. I will build my church. God's church, Christ's church, Christ will build his church whether or not I'm involved. But to what extent will you or I have the privilege of participating in that? Well, God's will is inscrutable. But I can't help but notice there's a strange correlation between God's providence and my interest. Have you ever noticed that? It's not always, it's not one for one, but there seems to be a high statistical correlation. It's called the correlation coefficient, coefficient between my seeking God, my Mention the word obedience and God's using you for me. Now, those of us in our tradition usually try to shy away from pointing out that there's high correlation coefficient between our obedience and the kingdom of God because we rightly understand that we are completely passive in justification. Right? So we have Martin Luther nailing the theses to the Wittenberg Cathedral. We are passive in justification. It is a monergism. Right? And admittedly, in the history of the church, when the church collectively has become overly concerned with sanctification, they have often gotten themselves into trouble with certain unnamed perfectionists at the end of the 18th century who then led to wackadoodle theologies of sanctification in the 19th century. Question, what good came out of the history of the church in the 19th century? Answer, nothing. <laughs> It was mostly bad. All right, Jim's saying, well, maybe not. It was mostly bad. It was like 99% bad. Most of the heresies that are still floating around in the American evangelical landscape came out of the 19th century, including those very nice young men who wear neckties and come to your door with a presentation. And they have these nice little identification tags right here. Also including the very nice people who sit and put up a booth outside of Walmart. Okay, now I'm being funny again. I shouldn't be funny about that. But the point is, I understand that there's a good historical and theological reason why we in the Reformed tradition re reactively recoil whenever people start talking about the S word. The S word. It starts with an S and ends with sanctification. 
All right. Because we don't want to fall into those errors. We don't want to fall into the error of Arminianism. We don't want to fall into the error of pietism. We don't want to fall into the error of gnomism, also known as legalism. All right. But God delivers us for a purpose. God delivered Paul for a purpose. Ultimately, God thought that it was best for his kingdom for Paul to be beheaded. Ultimately, God decided it was best for his kingdom that Peter would be crucified upside down. Ultimately, he decided it would be best for Andrew to be crucified on a cross in the shape of an X. Ultimately, God decided it would be best for Thomas to be killed in India with spears. And on and on and on, he thought it would be best in God's providence, according to church tradition, for uh, James, the half-brother of Christ, to be martyred in um, uh, Jerusalem by having him tossed from the temple. Okay. The history of the church is replete with the history of martyrs whom God did not deliver. But you remember Ridley, you remember Lattimore in England, and he said, play the man, Ridley, for today we will light such a fire in England that shall not be extinguished. And the Reformation took root in England, and for centuries, England was the number one producer in the world of missionaries, Bible scholars, pastors. Think about everything that God did from more or less 1560 in England until, I don't know, let's say 1900. I mean, England was where the kingdom of God was at. Right. All right. God delivered David from Saul, but not from Absalom. God delivered David, David and gave him the privilege of bringing the ark into Jerusalem, but he did not give him the privilege of building the temple. So in temporal terms, not with respect to Christ, but in temporal terms, there are many examples in Scripture where God delivered someone, but at some point drew a line and said, I'm not going to deliver you from this. All right? And in the case of David, I just used him as an example. He delivered him from Saul, but the reason he chose not to deliver him from Absalom, Nathan told him was because of his sin with Bathsheba. He chose to give him the privilege of bringing the ark in in 2 Samuel 6, but he, he told him, he, the reason I'm not going to deliver you, I, okay, I'm stretching the word deliverance there, but the reason he didn't give him the privilege of building the, the temple was because he had blood on his hands, too much blood on his hands. Scripture is full of examples of God's temporal deliverance for a purpose, but then at some point in his wisdom, he sees fit not to deliver us. The point is, what do you see? What do you see? The first question Jesus asks in the Gospel of John is, what do you see? There are two disciples of John the Baptist standing there and in chapter 1. One of them is Andrew. And they come to him, and they're all excited. And Jesus says, philosophically, I believe, what do you seek? What are you looking for? Now, if I stood up here and I told you, that 100% of my thought life, 100% of my affections, 100% of my purposes and goals and aspirations were centered on Christ and the kingdom of God, I would be a liar. Because that's not true. I wish it were true, but it's not. I don't love God the way I should. I don't love God's kingdom the way I should. <laughs> My goals, my aspirations, which I do a pathetic job of fulfilling, by the way. Set the goal, fail the goal, move the goalpost. Set the goal, fail the goal, move the goalpost. That's the story of my life. But even if I were a successful goal attainer, which I'm not, never have been, probably never will be, I, I would be lying to you if I told you that everything about what I want for my life, in regard to specific goals, specific aspirations, dealt with the kingdom of God, but it doesn't. And if my New Testament is to believe, I'm probably not the only one in the room who has that problem. 
Christ's kingdom is going to go on with or without me. Christ's kingdom will go on with or without you. And I can't guarantee from the New Testament, or Old Testament for that matter, that if you devote yourself to saying, I am going to set goals, specific, well, what, what is it, smart goals? Specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound. Isn't that the acronym? He's supposed to have, and it's Fred's smiling, because I'm sure he's been to 25 seminars on how to make smart goals. Right, Fred? You're supposed to make smart goals. If I, I can't guarantee you that if you make specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound goals related to anything, spiritual disciplines, evangelism, ministry involvement, mercy ministry, church involvement, whatever it is, that God would bless those. I can't guarantee you that he'll do that. I don't see a specific passage in Scripture saying that there's a one-for-one -one correlation between my goals and ideals and what God will do. But I do notice that often, and I'm not speaking facetiously here, often God chooses, and he condescends often, when we come to him and we say, Lord, please help me to pray. Often he helps us <laughs> fail in a better direction than we were failing before. <laughs> when we come to him, often it seems, and I'm not basing this on a particular text of scripture. So you can call, pick up the red telephone in the narthex and call directly to the Presbytery Committee and say we have heresy being preached here. I can't base it directly on the passage of Scripture, but I just know that in my own experience, and it seems that in the history of the church, often when people devote themselves to seeking God's face, when people devote themselves to saying, okay, I'm convicted about this sin, I want to repent of it, or please help me repent of it, often he, he deigns to work in our lives. Certainly, the star character of this passage is Christ. Christ is the one who delivers. Christ is the one who delivered Paul. The point I'm simply making is that at some point, Christ decided it's time for you to die, Paul. I believe that God delivered Paul for the purpose of getting him to Rome. And that at some point in Paul's life, when his purpose was over, God said, I'm going to take you home. And you've heard me say this before. Part of it is because I'm preaching to myself. If I'm still here, God's got something to do for me. God wants me to do something. Often, I feel useless. I do. I can only think that God wants me to come to him and say, Lord, I have a purpose. Here's where you've given me, in your providence, responsibilities. I feel useless. Frankly, I feel like a failure. In all of those areas, would you please help me to at least fail in the right direction? in those areas. Would you please help me to take a baby step in that direction? Is it possible that God wants us to evaluate the spheres in our life, the opportunities in our life, to think about possibilities and say, Lord, I'm not doing what I should do. In fact, I'm doing what I shouldn't. Would you help me? Would you deliver me from this sin? Would you deliver me from this weakness? Would you deliver me from this failure? 
not so that you can be my motivational speaker, not so that I can have my best life now, but so that I can do the things you want me to do on this earth. And not so that we can wallow in guilt, which is my tendency. But we can move out of the guilt and say, just as you delivered Paul for a time, for a purpose, would you deliver me from X, Y, and Z? Not so that I can live more fulfilled. I happen to know, I happen to have a reliable report that there is a certain unnamed person of spiritual influence in Alamogordo who talks about that all the time, I'm told. God wants you to be fulfilled. God's job is for, to help you be fulfilled. God does not owe you fulfillment. But he graciously gives you and me the opportunity to be a part of his kingdom. And if it means being a martyr, then it means being a martyr. And if it means being not a martyr, but someone who's totally obscure, then that's, that's good too. I heard a speaker say one time, God's purpose for Joseph was for him to be faithful in a time period about that long, and then you never hear from him again. He was the, what do you call him, stepfather? He was the adopted father of the Messiah. And his role that Joseph played was about that big. And then he's off the stage. Most of us are only going to be on the stage, walk around the corner of the stage for about three steps. But he's giving you three steps. What are you going to do with it? He's got a purpose for delivering you. Ultimately, in Christ, his purpose is to glorify himself by showering you with grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, that in the ages to come, he might show us the depth and the riches of his grace toward us in Christ. Amen, hallelujah. That's great, that's great stuff. In the meantime, he's got something for me and something for you. I don't know what it is for you. I'm not even really sure I know what it is for me, but I know that he wants me to be faithful. I know that I'm not. My Bible tells me I'm not the only one who has that problem. So can we seek God's face together? Can we say, Lord, help, help us? We're only here for a short time. I love it whenever I go to Jim and Katie's house and they have that little quote on their wall when you come in through those little steps by that little fountain. One short life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I want my life to count for something. I'll be gone soon. You'll be gone soon. Ecclesiastes tells us that even when we're gone, it's about that long before nobody remembers us. Not our kids, not certainly not our grandkids. And forget it for the rest of your descendants. You're, we're out of the picture. But he has us here for some reason. Paul's purpose was to get to Rome. I don't know what your purpose is, but God does. He may or may not give you an inkling of what that is. But will you join me? Can we seek his face? And can we say, Lord, help me? Help me. Deliver me so that I may give you glory in some way. Would you pray with me? We thank you that you ultimately delivered us in Christ. Help us to rest in that. And from a place of rest and security, seek your face. Not in order for you to save us, but because you have. Help us to fulfill the purpose you've given us and the time you've given us so short that we may enjoy you more and that Christ would be lifted up. And your kingdom will be glorious. In Jesus' name, amen. If you are able